Okay. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Molly Dubin, and I am the curator with the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And I'm thrilled to have you all here with us this evening for tonight's presentation, Encountering the Status Quo, A History of Protest in Art and Design. And we are offering this program in connection with our two current exhibits, Luba Lukova, Designing Justice and Shakespeare's In the Alley, a tribute to Bob Dylan. So before we get started, I just have a few uh, kind of announcements here. I ask for your patience with any technical glitches that might occur this evening. For those of you enjoying this program through Zoom, if you have any technical challenges during the talk, please use the chat feature, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen, and someone from the program's team will attempt to assist you. If we were at the museum, this would be the point in the program where I would ask you to silence your phones. Uh, tonight, we ask that you keep your microphones muted. And to get the very best experience possible from the program this evening, we are going to recommend that you view the program in speaker view. If you are currently seeing a Brady Bunch style gallery, you can select the speaker view option, which is also located in the top right hand corner of your screen. So I know that many of you have already made a donation to support this evening's program, which we are so appreciative of. Uh, if you haven't yet and you are able to, um, we would appreciate it and ask that you do as it enables us to continue to offer the exciting and edifying programs um, that we are continuing to, to offer during this difficult and challenging time. So we will be sharing a donation link in the chat box at the close of the program. So with those announcements out of the way, I would like to introduce our evening's presenter, Dr. Margaret Schmitz. Margaret is a lecturer at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, MIAD, where she is responsible for developing art and design history courses centered mainly on modernism and contemporary art. In 2017, she completed her PhD in the history and philosophy of art at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom. Dr. Schmitz's research interests in cross-cultural artistic exchange have introduced a specific set of convictions and intentions in her teaching. Her courses not only introduce students to major trends and theories in art history, but she tries to formulate these lessons in a way that allows students to view the power dynamics at play during a given period and to be more aware of absent or marginalized voices. So with that, please help me welcome Margaret Schmitz. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, just bear with me. I'm going to share my screen with you so we can get this presentation started. That looks right to me. All right, so uh, as you've uh, heard, you know, I'm a historian who's deeply interested in the way that artists and designers have created works that are symptomatic of the power dynamics at play within their respective historical contexts. So I'd like to share some of that with you today, and we're going to be using the theme of protest as our guide. So let's get started. There we go. So when we think of protest uh, in visual culture, perhaps one of the most famous artworks that comes to your minds is probably Picasso's Guernica. Um, so as a taster of things to come, let's kind of take a deep dive into this work. Uh, and then I'll kind of explain the rest of my plans for this talk today, which will involve contextualizing the current uh, wonderful exhibition on Luba Lukova's work at the Jewish Museum, of course. So let's, let's talk about Guernica. Guernica was made by Picasso uh, in the middle of the Spanish Civil War, which lasted between 1936 and 1939. 
you can think of this war as really a curtain raiser for World War II. Uh, it pitted the conservative fascist military government led by General Francisco Franco against the left-leaning uh, popular front government of the Spanish Republic in cahoots with certain anarchist and communist groups. <clears throat> uh, sort of at each other. Um, this was really a war known, therefore, for its many dualities, right? Um, communism versus fascism, republic versus dictatorship, uh, etc. And like all wars, it was marked by dramatic moments of human, particularly civilian, suffering. Guernica depicts this fact. It was not just men in combat, for example, who uh, you know, were suffering during this time. Picasso rather was concerned with a particular spectacle of death that happened on the 26th of April, uh, 1937. Uh, and using this event, he offers a picture of universal human pain. That day, the German Condor Legion, uh, who was aiding the fascist Franco, bombed the small historic village of Guernica, located in the center of Basque country. Several hundred, if not over a thousand men, women, and children were killed in this devastation. So inspired by reports and black and white photographs uh, coming from Guernica, Picasso created this monumental, and indeed it is an enormous uh, canvas, this monumental abstraction of the town in the immediate aftermath of the bombing. Picasso does not offer ideological redemption for those killed and maimed. This image is one of pure anguish. It is an emphatic protest against fascist violence. Guernica is perhaps one of the most celebrated images of protest because it was seen by so many. It was first exhibited in 1937, the same year it was made at the uh, Paris International Exposition uh, where thousands of people saw it uh, uh, for the first time. So what viewers would have first seen, of course, uh, uh, upon entering the pavilion is Guernica's enormous size, which would have by itself have been very moving. Uh, it's entirely monochromatic palette as well, uh, further dramatizes the composition. Uh, sort of taking a closer look at the composition, the light bulb, uh, a lone light bulb sort of illuminates the entire scene from the upper left of the canvas. Uh, human bodies and animals seem to writhe in pain. Now, remember, this was a market town, so uh, animals would have been uh, around, uh, sort of left without owners or dying themselves, uh, adding to the kind of chaos of the scene. Uh, meanwhile, you have uh, other people screaming, uh, looking for loved ones in the rubble, or uh, those lay that actually are laying uh, and dying and all bathed in this kind of ghostly white light. To create an even more poignant um, and memorable scene though, Picasso cleverly made associations to protest art from Spain's past. Uh, so I just wanna give out a trigger warning here for my next slide. There is some graphic image imagery in the next slide. So if you wanted to sit a couple minutes out, please do so. So there are, for example, many references to Goya. Uh, throughout this painting. Uh, the fallen dismembered body at the lower left of Guernica is quite reminiscent of Goya's The Disasters of War series, which he created between 1810 and 1820, which equally showcased the degradation humans were capable uh, of inflicting on each other. But Picasso's use of abstraction to showcase such a brutal scene also shows solidarity actually with more recent artists, the so-called degenerate artists of Nazi Germany, for example. After Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor in 1933, uh, Nazi agencies began to abolish the progressive collecting policies uh, of German art museums at the time, of course. And in the years that followed, the Nazis removed tens of thousands of modern artworks from state-owned museums. And famously, of course, in 1937, actually the same year Guernica was created and exhibited for the first time, over 700 modern works were exhibited um, by the likes of Henri Matisse, Max Beckmann, 
uh, many modernist artists uh, in the defamatory show, Degenerate, the Degenerate Art, right? Um, and this was a show that occurred in Munich that uh, was put on in order to quote unquote, educate uh, the public on the art of decay, right? Of modern decay. The exhibition purported to demonstrate that modernist styles such as abstraction were the result of genetic inferiority and modern society's moral decline. Uh, a well-known parallel, for example, was made between uh, mental illness and modernism. So in short, Guernica has gone down in history as an icon of protest art for several reasons. First of all, it was pretty timely, right? It was created smack dab in the middle of the Spanish Civil War uh, during a time in which um, fascism seemed to be running, running rampant uh, throughout Europe. Uh, secondly, its subject matter expresses universal human uh, emotions, which really stand the test of time. Thirdly, it made clever connections with moving uh, historic artistic precedents. And Goya uh, is just one example of this that we could have picked out. And finally, uh, its aesthetic stood in solidarity with the political left at the time. Now our aims, I think, at least in my mind with this talk today, uh, are very ambitious since, uh, in my opinion, all art and design is inherently political. Indeed, in his book, Minimum Moralia, the philosopher Theodore Adorno uh, once wrote that every work of art is an uncommitted crime. By this, Adorno meant that art throughout history has challenged the status quo, that it has the capacity to motivate radical social change, uh, that it can subvert, reject, or perhaps build upon cultural hegemony. Because this is true, our agenda for our talk today feels almost untenable in scope, since arguably you could look at any uh, piece of visual culture and uh, sort of dissect it in that way through this lens. So to help make things a little bit more manageable, I've taken some of the major themes present in the Jewish Museum's fantastic exhibition on Luba Lukova's work to sort of guide us today. And these themes consist of, but are not limited to, of course, uh, anti-war statements, uh, statements about greed, political greed, um, corporate greed, capitalist greed, uh, racial tensions, bodily autonomy, queer liberation, and finally environmental concerns. So I'm sure that uh, if you go through this exhibition yourself, of course, you could find uh, other themes as well, and I, I encourage you to do that. So I'm going to begin each section of this talk with a work by Lukova uh, and assess several uh, important historic precedents, I think, for this work that connect aesthetically uh, and conceptually uh, to sort of contextualize the exhibition further for you. Obviously, this aim is still rather ambitious, I think. Uh, therefore, you should consider today's talk, uh, you know, a cursory introduction to protest and visual culture. Uh, there's a reason why I, I named this talk a history, right? Because there are many histories. That's what it implies, at least. Uh, additionally, since Lukova's work is emphatically graphic, and by that I mean, aesthetically speaking, her work is more related to graphic or communication design than any other discipline, I'd like to prioritize works that fall into that category today. And what I love about Lukova's work actually is that she sort of mixes, you know, high art with design language. And actually this is something that you'll discover a lot of artist designers have done throughout history. So let's get started. And since we're already discussing Guernica, um, which is obviously an anti-war uh, piece, uh, let's start with that theme. One of Lukova's most celebrated series is her social justice portfolio, uh, which contains several dynamic and uh, cutting visualizations calling attention to a myriad of social issues, uh, one of which is war in its various contexts. The left work was made in response, for example, to the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Two faces are in profile uh, as if they are facing each other in combat. This potentially violent encounter is further underlined by the mushroom cloud that forms between them. However, the title of the work, Dialogue, 
uh, and the faces open mouths, which appear to be mutually communicating the phrase, war is not the answer, offers an alternative to potential violence. Meanwhile, the work on the right was inspired by a soldier who had lost uh, a leg uh, in, in the war. And inside the prosthesis is a caged dove, um, a universal symbol of peace, struggling though against this containment. The message here appears to indicate that peace and harmony can be found even after trauma. We just have to figure out how to free ourselves. So as you can see already, Lukova's work makes a really strong use of metaphor and she tends to juxtapose motifs um, and ideas together to create meaning. And in fact, Lukova's use of juxtaposition and metaphor brings to mind a lot, at least for me, a lot of anti-nuclear war uh, or postmodern anti-Vietnam war propaganda from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so let's further explore how graphic artists have used things like appropriation, metaphor, and contrast to uh, further their anti-war agendas. Polish designer uh, Trzkowski's poster here, uh, like Lukova's works, makes really strong use of seemingly simplistic imagery, which if we understood the historical context though, in which he was working, actually creates a web of very complex associations to generate a response in his viewers. Trzkowski made this poster at a moment in history when the devastating bombings uh, of European cities during World War II were still pretty fresh in people's minds. Nearly all of Warsaw, for example, uh, had been uh, decimated. And a ruinous facade reflected in the silhouette of a bomb in this poster metaphorically stands in for the countless cities left decimated. The threat of more uh, international conflict created a lot of propaganda like this in the 1950s, which promoted the cause of, of peace. Equally poignant though, is the fact that in this poster only one bomb is displayed uh, instead of many bombs. With the invention and the recent use of nuclear weaponry on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, one bomb could wipe out whole swaths of humanity for the first time in history. So suddenly the frantic single word below, nigh or no, doesn't um, seem so simple after all and seem, feels completely appropriate. Now Lukova is obviously drawing on a plethora of historic imagery to create her works um, and really the best postmodern the designers and artists did the, the same thing throughout the 1960s and 70s. Uh, this work uh, in our slide here is by the illustrator and designer Seymour Schwaist. Uh, his playful, expressive uh, approach to type and layout was really his strength, and he often used humor in his work as well to really get his message across, even if, it, even if it's dark humor. This is a, an anti-Vietnam War poster by Schwaist, and uh, it actually takes inspiration from uh, earlier German Expressionist woodcuts. Um, like this portrait of Christ by Schmidt Rutloff um, to kind of create a very emotive Uncle Sam, right? Uh, so Uncle Sam, meanwhile, is sort of centered in this, this sort of sun against a background of thick rays and his huge open mouth is filled with bombs and bomber planes. And I don't know if you can see that hopefully, but his lower teeth are made of houses that are on fire. And the directive at the bottom of the poster, end bad breath. Uh, humorously gestures to uh, uh, the sort of ending both conservative pro-war propaganda and the war itself. Uncle Sam, of course, is a traditional symbol of American patriotism. He is a beloved American uh, uh, a symbol, most well known from James Montgomery Flagg's I Want You poster, which was first um, used during World War I. However, this symbol has been subverted by Schwaist, appropriated by him to protest the United States, uh, their, its ongoing uh, uh, involvement in the Vietnam War. So instead of a stern patriotic uncle, we have a demented imperialist madman. It's the, a quintessential Schwaist design uh, using caricature and disjointed associations, a new meaning can be formed uh, for this iconic American character. 
So obviously, uh, again, we have uh, some appropriation happening here. You art history buffs in the room will recognize what is being appropriated. Um, the subject matter uh, uh, should be quite familiar to some of you. Uh, so this silkscreen poster was created in 1970 by uh, Jay Belloli, who was actually an art history student at UC Berkeley. Um, and he created it after the invasion, uh, the US invasion of Cambodia um, and during the Vietnam War, also uh, right after the Kent State and Jackson State shooting uh, the latter of which saw young students shot and killed by the police um, while protesting the war. Uh, so at this point, young Americans were really fed up with the Vietnam War and the US's tendency towards uh, imperialist conquest. Um, and students organized a lot of public poster making workshops across several campuses. And UC Berkeley had one of the most active anti-war uh, groups at the time. So Beloli's design for America as devouring its children obviously draws heavily um, from, here is another uh, use of Goya, uh, Francisco Goya's uh, Saturn devouring his son. So according to Greek myth, uh, Saturn's parents uh, told him that his children were trying to overthrow him. So uh, famously, according to myth, he uh, ate his children in order to retain power. So with the context of this story in mind, we can assume that Beloli made this poster to comment on both the drafting of young Americans to fight in what most saw was an unjust war uh, and the, also um, the murdering of university students on their own campuses by police and the National Guard while protesting that war. This poster feels really pressing for, for me today um, as our government's uh, seems to grapple with, um, or some, in some cases perhaps ignore the urgency of the growing pandemic. It also feels really relatable to what's going on in terms of these cases of police brutality against Black people that we've been grappling with uh, as a country. So to me, I think the best protest uh, art feels really timeless, and this work certainly uh, it is one of them. So this image uh, is from the 1980s, uh, which I think really contextualizes Lukova's work perfectly. In fact, and I'm not a specialist in Lukova's work by any means, but I feel like Lukova may have been inspired by this work to create her poster, uh, Peace and Planet, uh, which you can see on the right of your screen. Um, she's obviously well-versed in uh, political graphics as this poster on the left is, is not generally well-known. Um, certainly the in, in immediate correlations are the bomb or bullet motifs and the hand sort of stopping those things, um, those uh, motifs in both works. But also as we've seen, uh, the dove as a symbol of peace frequently crops up in Lukova's work as well. So the work on the left is a Nicaraguan uh, poster. It was designed by the Christian Conference for Peace in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. And it was done to support anti-US imperialism efforts in uh, Central and South America. So around this time, the United States was instigating several coups uh, within uh, many Latin American countries to kind of oust left-leaning governments and movements in favor of military-backed uh, conservative leaders, which inevitably frequently led to dictatorships in um, places like the Southern Cone, right, of South America. This poster represents the international solidarity movements occurring at that time to support uh, people, the people of these countries, right? Uh, the poster shows a white dove uh, whose tail kind of swings upward, morphing into a hand, which stops a row of bullets, sort of stopping symbolically the violence, uh, the impending violence. Lukova's work also makes use of an outstretched hand uh, that kind of demarcates the space between lethal weaponry and something delicate, in this case, uh, the, the planet and the future of humanity. To draw things to a close in our first section here, I'd like to draw your attention to a relatively recent work, uh, which reminds me of Lukova's use of silhouette and her use of strong color contrast as well. Uh, this piece titled Iraq is by two uh, different American design collectives, uh, Forkscrew Graphics and uh, Copper Green. Uh, and it's one of the most iconic anti-war posters to be uh, produced in reaction to the Iraq war. Uh, 
a rock combines all of the graphic elements found in Apple uh, in Apple's iPod advertising campaign from the early 2000s, which you might recognize. Uh, but instead of a person uh, having fun listening to music and dancing, we have a silhouette of a well-known leaked image uh, of an Iraqi prisoner being tortured by US military personnel. Um, Abu Ghraib prison, where the torture was occurring, became a symbol of everything wrong with the United States' handling of the Iraq war. The sarcastic riff on the iPod advertisement, I think illuminates how many Americans seem to be ignoring the atrocities committed by the US Army at the time, sort of turning to the frivolity of their consumerist lives uh, rather than taking action in the streets, or at least I think that's what this appropriation is, su is supposed to sort of tell us or reflect to us. All right, so let's move on into our next theme, greed. Uh, protest art and design has taken on the notion of greed in many manifestations. Uh, for example, this is Lukova's uh, income gap from, again, from her social justice portfolio. Might be familiar to some of you, hopefully, who've seen the exhibition. Um, obviously, she's visualizing the old adage, um, taking a piece of the pie. Uh, but this isn't a fair distribution, is it? Uh, the fork taking the majority of the pie here could signify a variety of things. Perhaps the income gap between men and women, perhaps the income gap between white women and black women. Um, but I think more likely, since there's only one greedy fork here, Lukova could be referring to the 1% uh, who own the majority of the world's wealth, uh, while the majority of the world's people earn a pittance. So this work here, I think, uh, Lukova's use of scale uh, sort of reminded me of this illustration by the African-American artist uh, Reynold Ruffins from 1970. So while Ruffins' work can be quite psychedelic and colorful, a lot of his early work consisted of quirky illustrations like this, monochromatic illustrations. Um, so in it, we have two uh, white men dressed in colonialist garb who are greedily eating a lobster uh, on, on top of this, um, in this fishing boat on top of this water. And meanwhile, we have this huge uh, lobster who is about to topple them over and gobble them up. So within the historical context of the 1970s, which uh, as we've seen, saw a groundswell of people um, protesting and challenging the status quo, uh, this is perhaps a cool and subtle take on the uh, white heteropatriarchy's greed and those looming underneath, ready to kind of threaten it and topple it all over, right? And part of the reason why I chose this work actually today um, is because the subject matter is oddly relevant. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this in the news lately, but uh, indigenous lobstermen in Nova Scotia are being attacked uh, physically for exercising their rights to fish and hunt uh, lobster traditionally. Um, and of course, they have every right to do this. It's, being, it's been upheld through treaties and various uh, legislative decisions. Um, and the fact that we have a pair of greedy colonizers, um, about, the fact that they're about to sort of be hit by a counterattack by this enormous lobster feels sort of applicable to our present moment. So the idea of greed as this sinful attribute is really something that is as old as humanity. So by taking on this theme, Lukova is uh, responding again to this age old problem, just maybe through di a different means and in different contexts. So I primarily wanted to stick to the 20th and 21st centuries today, but I couldn't help myself. I had to show this work. <laughs> it's, it's a very early work, but it's one of my favorite, um, uh, very early pieces of protest art. Um, this is, a, again, also an early form of um, mass media as well. Uh, it was made just as the printing press uh, in Europe was really uh, kicking off and changing how uh, people gained information. It's a work by the German artist Lucas Cranach, uh, who was a staunch supporter of the Protestant Reformation during the Renaissance. And the leader of the Reformation, Martin Luther, uh, really relied on his dedicated artist friends to create a political visual message, uh, often produced on cheap broadsides and prints uh, for the illiterate masses to consume and, and learn, right? 
Uh, so the work here is actually a redrawn copy of an earlier engraving uh, recording the alleged appearance of a monster along the river Tiber in Rome. Uh, only Kronik has given it a modern twist by accompanying uh, the image with the text above, which says the donkey pope of Rome or the ass of Rome. Uh, so viewers would have recognized uh, the vulgarity of the subject, uh, this monster with its donkey's head, a woman's body, a dragon's tail, as a depiction of the monstrous and greedy pope. One of the main gripes that the new Protestants had with the Catholic Church was the use of indulgences. These involve people giving money uh, to the church to lessen their punishment in the afterlife. Think of it as essentially buying your way into heaven, right? Uh, the Protestants were not keen on this and saw through the Catholic Church as, the, really, they saw through the Catholic Church's greed, right? And uh, works like this really aided the Protestants uh, in exposing the church's real intentions at that time. As we, I'm sure, are all aware, you know, greed can come in many forms, greed for money, greed, but there's also, of course, greed for political power. Um, this work is one of the greatest examples of anti-fascist protest art made during the Nazis' rise to power, which I think connects with the latter uh, uh, theme here, uh, greed for political power and power really uh, in its darkest way. Uh, it was uh, created by the German Dada artist, John Hartfield, uh, for a leftist magazine at the time in 1932. Dadaism was all about, you know, rejecting and tearing down the status quo, and they were emphatically a leftist movement. Uh, therefore, they were profoundly anti-fascist and very critical of Hitler and his cronies. Hartfield created many photo montages, poking fun uh, at or revealing the true intentions of Hitler. So, for example, he's obviously appropriated images from Hitler's many speeches, uh, only instead of Hitler's chest, we actually have an x-ray, uh, someone's x-ray, uh, and in his belly we have a pile of gold coins, and a stack of gold coins seems to rise up through his throat or perhaps even comprise his spine. Um, but this gold essentially references iconographically to the wealthy industrialists that were funding the party, right? And the text at the bottom of the image reads, Adolf Superman swallows gold and spouts junk, which suggests that Hitler's uh, famous charisma was false and corrupted. So this work also feels very relevant for, for me today. You know, if we, I, quest, certain questions crop up in your mind, right? If we let the wealthy fund our governments in favor of certain legislative changes, um, uh, tax cuts or disassembling um, environmental regulations, for example, who is our government really catering to, right? So all of these questions, I think, make, make some of these works relevant. So let's close this section by bringing up a work that was made just last year uh, uh, in Colombia. The national strike in Colombia were a series of protests that lasted from late last year on into early uh, 2020, so just this year. And the strike began when labor unions, uh, students, indigenous groups, feminist organizations, and other sectors of Colombian society uh, got together and sort of turned in opposition to the current right-wing government. Their main grievances included uh, labor and pension reforms, widespread corruption, and the lack of government compliance with public education agreements, uh, and, and of course, many other issues too. While artists have used a variety of media to document these protests, these recent protests, uh, these protests against the government's greed, right? Uh, Liliana Marizalde uh, took inspiration from the nightly banging of pots and pans during the protest for this series of works. So she went around in the protest carrying uh, a vinyl black paint and blank newsprint uh, to these marches. And she asked protesters to create prints uh, from the bottom of their pots. Uh, she then notes each individual's name, uh, the number of hours they've been out in the street protesting, and uh, the date. So this is one of the many pieces that she's created. Obviously, we have an imprint of the bottom of a pot here. Uh, the person uh, who owns this pot who's protesting is Carolina. She's been out there for 24 hours, and it's the 27th of November. So the works demonstrate the, I think, the autonomy 
of the individuals taking part in the protest and uh, provides a really intimate, unique stamp, if you will, of each person, sort of like their fingerprint. Yet when displayed together, I'm sure all of these prints together, they're, they're almost, there's sort of visualization of a collective voice, right? And I think the recording of time on the posters is also very important. And by combining all of these elements, Marizalde was able to take control over how these events might later be historicized and remembered. So let's move on to the, a theme that's quite frequently uh, seen in Lukova's work, uh, and that's racial tensions, right? This poster was created for the 50th anniversary of the civil rights movement. It depicts uh, in Lukova's characteristic silhouettes, uh, Martin Luther King uh, seated peacefully protesting, holding the phrase, I have a dream in his hands. Meanwhile, these rabid dogs bark and kind of gnash their teeth at him. Uh, their owners are hidden and mysterious, sort of uh, perhaps signifying uh, the insidious nature of uh, systemic racism. So visual protests toward racism um, have shown up in countless artworks uh, uh, and works of design for many years, uh, but really picked up with the onset of the civil rights movement. So let's start from that point. As the civil rights movement gained traction throughout the 1960s, police brutality and racism still reigned. Uh, as a result, a group called the Black Panther Party, uh, originally called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, uh, was formed to protect and defend Black lives. Emory Douglas's work is a quintessential example of postmodern political resistance, specifically towards racism. Uh, he was the Minister of Culture, uh, for the Black Panther Party for many years. And since then, he's used his eclectic illustrative uh, techniques to deliver these true, you know, punch in the gut messages. Like many postmodern designers, he's a magpie uh, when it comes to visual references. He takes inspiration from many things uh, and appropriates them in his work. In fact, the original Black Panther symbol, for example, uh, which you see here in this iconic poster by Douglas, uh, was actually originally used by a voting rights group in Alabama during uh, the civil rights movement when black folks were subjected to numerous violent attempts to suppress their vote. Douglas and uh, the Black Panther Party appropriated this symbol for their own fight for equal rights and to create a really powerful affirmative image of black life. I think it's the perfect counter symbol to the rabid dogs in Lukova's work. During the mid 1960s in the deep south, particularly in Alabama and Mississippi, black civilians and civil rights workers who fought to end well over a century of uh, institutionalized racism were frequently uh, brutalized and killed. In 1969, Seymour Schwaist, and yes, so this name should be familiar, he also did our Uncle Sam work earlier. Uh, Schwaist actually here is paying homage to uh, uh, several martyrs uh, for the civil rights uh, cause. Uh, the formatting of each work um, pairs a kind of idealized Southern uh, US stereotype in the background of each work. And again, these, these are just two of a whole series of works that he created. Um, and for example, let's focus on that lower portion, lower work right here. Uh, in the background, we have an idealized image of Southern life, right? We have two uh, wealthy white people being uh, chauffeured around by a black man in this exotic Southern setting. Only inset within each of these idealized scenes is uh, an image uh, of a martyr for the civil rights cause. Each photograph is pierced with a black hole in the center, signifying the person's death, as well as the symbolic end of the old mythologized uh, Southern virtue that the backgrounds are sort of celebrating. So the top uh, person here being depicted is uh, Emmett Till. Of course, um, he was the little boy who was lynched for uh, having allegedly uh, a whistle at a white woman. And uh, down below, we have Harry Moore, who was a great leader in the civil rights movement, member of the NAACP, and he was murdered when a bomb was planted underneath his home. The systemic killing of Black people is not something that has gone away. 
uh, much like this past year, uh, people took to the streets back in 2013 uh, after an unarmed 17 year old boy named Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman, the neighborhood watchman. Uh, so after Zimmerman obviously was found not guilty, I'm sure everyone remembers, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement was founded to raise people's consciousness uh, about systemic racism and inherent biases toward race. It also was and is intended as a community to uphold, affirm, uh, and celebrate Black life. The Black Lives Matter Global Network has since been founded and numerous graphic campaigns have been created to uphold this movement's agenda. The, this image here, for example, by Jesus Barraza uh, depicts Trayvon Martin uh, smiling innocently in front of a vibrant green black, uh, background. Uh, the text below uh, humanizes him, I think, and forces viewers to connect the smiling face with a name and a sense of personhood especially during a time in which his face was sort of plastered all over the media. I think images like this uh, remind the public that this is a person, right? Another racialized issue that frequently comes up in Lukova's work is uh, immigration. Uh, her, her work on the right here, uh, They Take Our Jobs, uh, shows a person, presumably an immigrant, cleaning toilets. Now this is frequently the excuse made by folks who fear immigrants coming into their country when in fact their fear is based on how much immigrants may change how they would prefer their country to look culturally or racially. So this xenophobic thinking uh, can also be found in Europe as well. Uh, the refugee crisis there is very dire. Uh, the war in Syria has exacerbated the situation and people fleeing the conflict often take desperate measures to save themselves and to, and of course their children from almost certain death and violence. And the graphic designer uh, and illustrator Dugudus uh, produced this poster on the left to call attention to this crisis and advocate for European countries to welcome refugees and immigrants seeking shelter. And he uses the image here of a three-year-old island Kurdi from Northern Syria, whose body washed up on the beach in Turkey in 2015, as he and his family uh, fled to Europe in an overloaded boat um, that had capsized. Uh, I'm sure that some of you remember um, I Island's, uh, the, the image of, of Island. And he's since become uh, a symbol of the countless refugees that have died in this way. The life rings around him are plastered with uh, stickers representing several European countries who could have thrown him a lifeline, but did not. So apologies for the quality of this image in this next slide. I couldn't for the life of me find one online. So you know, I'm using one that I took myself. Uh, this is an interesting one for Lukova, uh, given that it is actually a photograph um, uh, sort of set against a flat kind of intense red background instead of her usual graphic silhouettes. Uh, the photograph shows a hanger that has been shaped into a cross and on the lower right we have the words body politics in uh, bold yellow. Um, so the hanger is obviously uh, a reference to the dangerous black market uh, abortions women were forced to seek before abortion was made legal in this country. Uh, the moralizing control of religion uh, in, is another iconographic reference here, uh, which gestures to, you know, religious fanatics meddling in matters of state and law, not to mention personal choice. And it's one of Lukova's most powerful and haunting images, I think. So with that, let's focus on our next theme of bodily autonomy. Lukova's work is one that has many historic precedents. Again, uh, the fight for female autonomy, bodily autonomy has been being <laughs> been battled for decades. Uh, and Barbara Kruger here, whose work here you can see is uh, was formerly actually a graphic designer uh, at big publications like House and Garden, uh, but she left commercial design to pursue her interest in the arts. And like Lukova, her work is a really neat blend of art and design. Using her experience as a designer, Kruger found a language she could use to critique the power dynamics implicit in um, gender issues in the United States. Kruger's poster here contains a black and red color scheme, uh, bold lettering and use of photo montage, and that positive and negative dichotomy in the photo. 
really helps to polarize and excite the image. And it's galvanizing intent, which is of course to communicate to all women that decisions are being made about your bodies. Uh, you better join the fight. Your body is a battleground. This one could be familiar to some of you as well. Uh, much like Lukova and Kruger, the Guerrilla Girls have used the language of advertising and design to shed light on uh, gender discrimination. Um, the Guerrilla Girls are, of course, an anonymous group of feminist female artists uh, devoted to fighting sexism, specifically in the art world. Um, and the group formed in the 1980s in New York City. Uh, and importantly, there's this an intersectional uh, mission, meaning they take into account the intersectional hurdles specific to uh, women of color uh, and black women. And the group usually employs uh, tactics like culture jamming uh, in the form of posters, billboards, books, uh, and also public appearances to expose discrimination and corruption. Uh, so to remain anonymous, famously, they always don gorilla masks like the one that you see in this work here. And this piece is uh, a, a very well-known piece by the Gorilla Girls, Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum? Uh, uh, obviously, the tagline here, less than 5% uh, of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female, uh, calls out the Met and more more broadly other museums too, for having a kind of male gaze, uh, if you will. And they further underline this idea by appropriating this Anne image, La Grande Odalisque, uh, in, in um, their poster, only instead of a demure face, you have this sort of snarling gorilla. Moving ahead, Renee Cox is an Afrofuturist photographer, and by that I mean her work deals with science fiction elements that affirm and celebrate uh, fantastical Black futures. Uh, for example, her alter ego, Rajay, is this self-styled female superhero that goes around deconstructing colonialist and uh, racial constructions. Uh, Cox uses her Black female body uh, which has historically either been fetishized or typecast as representing some uh, spiritual inner strength to speak to, flat, to Black female agency and independence. Uh, in the work Taxi on the left, she physically stops a cab to make a statement about New York City cabs uh, ignoring Black customers in favor for white customers. Uh, while in my favorite on the right, we have a work called Liberation of uh, Lady J and UB. Uh, similar to Kruger and the Gorilla Girls, a Cox co-ops and invades mass advertising in, in this work to create a political statement. Um, in this work, Roger is rescuing, of course, the characters Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima from their respective food products, both of which contain caricatures that perpetuate the idea uh, that the Black body must constantly serve. Upso the Upsalic artist um, Wendy Redstar uh, has similarly appropriated a segment of mass culture in her series White Squaw, which reveals the racism behind Native caricatures, such as the hypersexualized uh, Native heroine found in the sexually explicit 1980s book series by the same name, which you can see on the left. So in her posters, uh, Red Star features herself as this uh, stereotypical native maiden uh, painted with red lips. Uh, she has a sassy, inviting smile, and she's shown in a variety of provocative poses uh, next to the book's catchphrases that barely disguise their sexual uh, intent. So in short, Red Star is using the language of a sexualized racist caricature to critique it and jab holes into colonizer fetishizations of female indigeneity. Red Star and many other native artists who use photography as their medium often use it um, as a means of radical self-imaging uh, and a revising of visual identity codes that have until recently largely been created by those in power. So with her photographs, uh, Red Star actually debunks the notion of authenticity and truth that, that are routinely, routinely uh, tied to the medium of photography. She shows how falsehoods can be generated through gestures and cultural codes and that every photograph could contain artificiality. So using her own body, she 
establishes her uh, absolute uh, subjectivity by toying with the idea of indigeneity as both a real experience as well as a constructed one. Getting towards the tail end of our discussion today. Uh, so this poster was created by, uh, uh, for a uh, healthcare union by Lukova to uh, accompany the union members as they marched in the NYC Pride March of 2016. And very uh, poignantly, this march occurred mere days after the Pulse nightclub shooting in which a homophobic man killed nearly 50 people. Lukova celebrates the motif of a hard fist by uh, sort of appropriating imagery from uh, several uh, social justice movements of the past that have used the fist, you know, the Black Power Fist, also uh, the C Red Women's Workshop used uh, a fist uh, in the 1970s uh, during the feminist uh, movement. Um, but below this fist, we have a rainbow bracelet and two hands that sort of interlock together, um, kind of indicating that there is power in collective pride. Uh, and that only by supporting one another can queer folks really be liberated. The battle for LGBTQ plus rights has been going on for a long time. So let's have a look at how past artists uh, and designers uh, have uh, tackled this issue and protested the heteropatriarchy's homophobia. And let's start in the 1980s when really um, the uh, queer liberation movement really kicked off in earnest. Uh, this is a billboard the, uh, on the upper left of your screen there. It's a billboard by the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres. It was created in 1989 uh, and it was placed in New York City's West Village, which was the heart of the city's queer community. The billboard was placed there actually again to commemorate uh, the Stonewall riots and World Pride just last year. Um, and it's estimated that way back in even in 1989, uh, at one of the first gay and lesbian liberation day marches, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people passed by this billboard. Uh, the artist, Felix Gonzalez Torres, uh, actually died in the 1990s from AIDS complications. Um, and he built a really considerable body of work dedicated to the disruption of mainstream hierarchies, uh, histories, and chronologies. He, indeed, he works with chronologies in really interesting ways. So let's see how he's doing this in, in this work. And I've actually blown up on the right-hand side of your screen what the uh, billboard says in case you can't really read it in uh, the slide. So obviously he's uh, listed uh, several dates here. Um, pe People with AIDS Coalition, 1985, which indicates the year in which uh, the coalition was formed. Police harassment, 1980, uh, excuse me, 1969, probably refers to when the New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn, which was a gay club uh, located in, in Greenwich Village. And uh, it sort of set off the Stonewall riots when uh, uh, the LGBTQ plus community for the first time really uh, started fighting back. Um, so it goes on and on from there. So obviously the work doesn't list uh, these events in chronological order, right? Uh, Gonzalez Torres is basically blending significant moments in queer history to showcase that the struggle continues and show solidarity with past um, uh, queer figures as well. As you are all likely aware, the gay community uh, was severely impacted by the 1980s AIDS epidemic. Uh, it was at this point in history that the term queer was adopted as a powerful positive term that radicalized and rallied the LGBTQ community in a really politicized way as well. And a group of LGBTQ uh, collaborators at the time made this poster to raise awareness about the politicization of AIDS by certain conservative politicians. Um, it has since really become an icon of, of protest art related to LGBTQ plus uh, issues. So let's explore what's going on in this poster. The poster beckons people to talk with one another, not only about the disease, but also to take political action. Um, after all, it wasn't until um, September of 1985 that President Ronald Reagan even used the word AIDS publicly for the first time. And this was actually four years after the um, crisis began. And by then thousands and thousands of people had already died. So below the bold words, silence equals death, the poster reads, why is Reagan silent about AIDS? What is really going on at the CDC, the Food and Drug Administration and the Vatican? 
Gays and lesbians are not expendable. Use your power, vote, boycott, defend yourselves. Turn anger, fear, grief into action. And above these words is a pink triangle, which went on to become a poignant symbol for the queer community. Now, historically, uh, an upside down version of the pink triangle was used to mark gay people um, in Nazi concentration camps uh, to sentence them to the gas chambers. Uh, here, the triangle is triumphantly turned upward, uh, appropriated and redefined uh, as a heroic symbol, uh, much like the term queer was appropriated and redefined uh, as a, a powerful word at this time. So here is our last theme. I know I'm, I'm getting up to the, the end here. Uh, I'm looking at the time. Uh, so let's, let's focus on environmental concerns and wrap it up. Uh, so perhaps one of the most pressing existential issues we face today is the threat of climate change. Uh, human beings in late capitalism have kind of forgotten their uh, place in the symbiotic relationship that all living things have with one another. And Lukova and a variety of artists uh, since the onset of the green movement really in the 1970s have raised concerns about how we treat our home, earth, right? Uh, Lukova creates an obvious metaphor here uh, for humanity's hubris toward our species assumed invincibility. Uh, the poster depicts a human who appears to be willingly chopping himself in two. Uh, in effect, it says we can't survive as a species without honoring our dependency on the earth's health and not doing so would be tantamount to suicide. The root of environmental protest uh, really started, as I mentioned, in the 1970s, but the so-called green movement or earth movement has its roots actually in the 1960s counterculture of hippie dropouts uh, seeking to better their relationship with Mother Earth, uh, but also to many indigenous uh, life ways as well. Uh, indigenous folks were gaining more attention in the United States uh, as a result of the American Indian movement, which kicked off uh, in the 1970s as well. So all over people started to become more concerned with their treatment of the planet. And for example, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970, Greenpeace was formed in 1971 as well. And many posters and mass cultural objects were produced to propagandize cleaner living and a deeper respect for nature uh, and the future of humanity. The American artist Robert Rauschenberg uh, created this poster for the first Earth Day. Uh, it shows a defiant bald eagle in the center, kind of representative of nature's power as well as its fragility. Uh, and, and, but meanwhile, surrounding the eagle, we have images of uh, environmental devastation, pointing out the fragility further of our Earth, um, uh, I think is a, a common theme actually in a lot of climate change awareness works. This ironic World War I propaganda poster on the left, Daddy, What Did You Do in the Great War, has been appropriated by a few artists over the years for hum humanity's fight against um, dis the disastrous environmental effects of nuclear war and nuclear testing on one hand, but also against climate change deniers too. Uh, Lumley's original poster, again on the left here, uh, has become one of the best known because of its tone of emotional blackmail. Um, its shaming is still quite effective today. Uh, and in, in the center here, we obviously have a work that's uh, appropriated, uh, this, this original image from 1977. It's by Tony Robertson and Chips Mac McAnulty. Um, and it's called, Daddy, What Did You Do During the Nuclear War? And obviously daddy's children have uh, suffered disastrously from this nuclear war. We can see um, what the little girl has multiple legs and multiple noses, and I'm sure you could find more uh, abnormal abnormalities as you look. And the work on the right hand side uh, appropriated this image further. Uh, and this is from 2017 by Josh uh, McPhee. Uh, so very recently it was um, appropriated. Uh, only daddy and his, his children are certainly not faring any better. Um, the polar ice caps have melted and they're being forced to live underneath uh, the ocean at this point. So here's my last piece for you. This is a very recent poster. Uh, it was created by the designer Predag uh, Pesic, uh, and it can be found actually along with many others uh, in an open source archive, which you can find yourselves. Um, it's a, a Google, uh, essentially a Google Drive folder that's just full of amazing climate change um, uh, posters like this. Um, 
Uh, so Pasek has appropriated here an iconic image of Earth, uh, well known today as the blue marble uh, taken by the Apollo 17 mission famously in 1972. And it's one of the most reproduced images uh, of all time made uh, poignant by our perceived solitariness in the black universe. Uh, but of course, in front of the image here, uh, Pesek has created a foreboding message, uh, which looks eerily like an Apple computer alert. Uh, its message really points to the urgency of acting now, lest we face almost certain disaster. It reads, are you sure you want to restart your planet now? Uh, if you do nothing, the planet will restart automatically in 500 years. Certainly quite foreboding. So as we close our talk today, Let's turn our attention to this last image by Lukova. Uh, she created this image to protest uh, mass incarceration and its link to poverty, uh, or to at least uh, sort of show, show how those uh, can be connected. And uh, after covering so many topics, you might be feeling overwhelmed uh, by the problems that we've faced and the problems that we still face uh, and still contend with, um, uh, but similar to the metaphor in this poster, I don't want you to feel burdened or defeated. I want you to leave today feeling empowered to turn these feelings and this knowledge into something positive. Remember that uh, protest uh, graphics and art change minds long before their messages are funneled into direct action. Uh, protest and visual culture is similar to oral and written language in that way. Um, chants that have united folks uh, of late, including Black Lives Matter chants uh, or hard discussions that uh, we have with family members, uh, friends, neighbors, further create community consciousness. And over time, uh, hopefully, finally, we can have a systemic change, right? So that is all I have for you. I will, I'm really excited to hear your comments or any questions that you might have. Thanks so much for listening. Wow, that was just fantastic, Margaret. Oh, thank you, Molly. I'm, I, <laughs> I hope, I, did everyone, I'm, I'm worried that everyone couldn't see the, the slides. I was worried, I don't know if like, cause I see everyone's faces still on my PowerPoint but I'm hoping that was not visible. Uh, no, I, <laughs> I the images were were very much there. Um, but if you wouldn't mind actually stopping sharing yeah. your screen, and that'll allow me to uh, get into some of the yeah. questions here. I'm gonna shift back to you. And comments and, too. Uh, let's let's yeah. let's take a look at at some of our questions here. Um, yeah, that, so much food for thought. And, and as you said, you just barely kind of, you know, is the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of everything that's out there, but some incredible examples. Um, and I love the, the juxtaposition of, of showing where, you know, Luba probably was getting her inspiration or, or was, you know, drawing on. Um, so we have a, a question from, uh, a uh, friend of the museums, who's also a art museum uh, docent, so knowledgeable and probably uh, recognize many of those images that you shared. So um, the question is with the recent interest in street art and mural art as a means of protesting social injustice, how do you see history evaluating this as a quote unquote real art form? Oh, I mean, I think it's it. A lot, there's actually a lot of scholars right now who are working on street art. I have personally, I have several colleagues, uh, even back when I was doing my PhD, uh, writing their PhDs on street art. So it's certainly something that is um, gaining more attention from the quote unquote academy, right? So uh, it it is, and it's 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 extremely important um, in terms of. Pro protest art, it's extremely important because remember what, you know, what I was talking about in terms of Guernica, but also in terms of a lot of these other pieces, what makes them so, uh, you know, valuable is their visibility. So uh, something that can be seen by the broader public that's not necessarily stuck in a museum. I think that is super important. And also we're living in the digital age, right? A lot of these, um, 
uh, works, these uh, these graffiti works, these street art uh, works, uh, now don't necessarily just live in their in situ, right? They're living online, they're being dispersed and disseminated and other people can see them uh, and study them and appreciate them and then, then share them, right? So their, their messages certainly are, are valuable in that way. I, I think they're incredibly important, yeah. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> oh yeah, well, very, very interesting. Um, so I kind of have, I have a question for yeah. you. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of you know the image appropriation. Oh yes, and you know, and so clearly, you know, some of these contemporary, well, you know, from the 30s through the 50s through the 80s through today, you know, um, you know, harkening back on some some of these images that that really go quite a bit back in, in terms of art history or, or events. Um, and I'm just curious, I mean, of course we look at kind of the, you know, mass culture, but um, certainly some of these images are much older than um, some of the more contemporary, you know, images that are appropriating them. And I'm just wondering about the role, I guess, of yeah. the collective consciousness of, of this type of image and how much, you know, is reliant on that idea of that collective consciousness. I think that's a huge part of it. I think that's really what makes a lot of these works effective is that um, they're appropriating things that already have been solidified in the public consciousness, right? And sort of turning them on their head in a way. And I think that effectively uh, helps people sort of critique or navigate what they thought before about the image, mm -hmm. uh, or what kind of value or judgment they had put before on the image um, and see it in a new way. I think that's really important. And it's it's something that, yeah, I think you're you're totally right to point out that it's been happening for forever. I mean, if we just look at the Lucas Cranach from the 16th century, that exactly. itself was an appropriation um, of an earlier graphic, an earlier drawing. Um, but certainly we see an uptick in stuff like that in the postmodern period in the 60s and 70s. And during this time, um, a, a lot of a lot of talk was a lot of theory was going on at this time in terms of uh, you know, for example, something called detournement. This is a French fancy French term, right? Um, which it was a technique, a sort of graphic and artistic technique that was developed by uh, French situationist artists uh, in the 1960s. And essentially what Detournement did was, um, it, it's exactly what we're talking about, is sort of taking uh, an existing graphic image or an existing image of any kind really, and uh, playing with that, with the public's consciousness about it and sort of turning it over, Detournement really meaning redirection or mm -hmm. uh, literally meaning redirection, right? Uh, so I think that it's it's super important for, for a lot of these images that there is an existing presence of that image in the culture, right? Um, yeah, I hope, again, I hope that answers your question. No, it absolutely does. And and I was definitely thinking back to, to the, you know, the, <laughs> the piece of Donkey Pope of Rome. <laughs> right. I mean, I am just so blown away by the fact that that's 1523 yeah. and, you know, so clearly, you know, encapsulates the <laughs> issues. And as you said, you know, very understandable to the illiterate masses um, and the fact that it was being distributed. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that the medium was through mass distribution, which, you know, added to its its impact, um, which of course carries through to the, you know, the 60s and to today. I think that's, you know, I love that that Luba Lukova's work is is posters, which you know is is very clearly rooted in you know the idea of the poster art, the graphic, the media being accessible to the masses. Yeah, absolutely. And think about the civil rights movement, you know, the grass movement, grassroots movements. Excuse me, you know, what was the medium that the masses were using? It, it was the poster, you know. Um, so all of these things, just you know, so interesting the way that they dovetail. Um, and, and looking back to some of those, Saturn devouring his son is, is probably, 
one of my favorite pieces. I, I you can tell I'm a little macabre in my. <laughs> Same. But you know, I it's amazing to me that you talked about that in, in terms of you know a timeless image, yeah. um, you know, and being utilized. You know, you look back to you're looking at Greek mythology, and <laughs> and you know this image being used and used effectively in opposition to the Vietnam War um, and the invasion of Cambodia. I mean. It's just so amazing to me that, you know, the classical art canon and, you know, the way it continues, you know, and that there are a couple of other additional Luba's works that we didn't talk about that also, you know, tap into that as well. Um, so it, it, it's really, it's, it's interesting to think about in terms of that collective consciousness and, and appropriation and, yeah. and, you know, mass distribution and impact um, and that, that, saying that we keep going back to, I think that again, is so appropriate that, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words and um, so clearly <laughs> shown in this presentation. So um, with that, if, if we don't have any other questions, I know I could keep Margaret on. <laughs> no, I could, I could keep talking too, but yeah. <laughs> you know, talk at a different time, but, um, <laughs> but I, I want to uh, thank you so much for oh my this. Gosh, my pleasure. Thank you all for having me. Engaging presentation. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that some of our docents uh, or, or people who are very interested in studying, maybe wanting to look at uh, how they might be able to, um, to take your classes. <laughs> <laughs> I would <laughs> welcome you all. Opportunity, you know, to, <laughs> to sit in on some of that, but fascinating. So thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for being with us. Um, again, thank you for support, supporting us through your donations to make programs like tonight's possible. And with that, just wanna mention a couple other upcoming programs that are kind of ongoing with uh, our theme of exploring uh, social justice issues. On Wednesday, November 4th, 7 p.m., we have a book club, and uh, this is in collaboration with the Coalition for Jewish Learning, and we're going to be looking at the book Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and a Mother's Will to Survive by Stephanie Land, which really is uh, an exploration of, of poverty in America, a fairly gritty exploration. Uh, and then also Tuesday, November 10th at 7 p.m., uh, the next in our Critical Conversation Starter Series. And this is gonna be looking at the evolving role and impact of philanthropic and nonprofit organizations. So um, leaders of organizations like Bader Philanthropies, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, United Way, the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, really looking at services and opportunities um, surrounding key issues like education, transportation, healthcare, and response initiatives um, and coordination and expanding, you know, those uh, initiatives in, uh, in terms of the pandemic and current events. So just a couple of the things coming up for a full list of our programs, please visit our website. And thank you again to Margaret. Thank you to our audience. And we'll hope to see you soon, if not in the museum, then uh, on the small screen. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.